I mean, you could drop my dad into a church with only 10 people with a for sale sign and out in, on the front of the lawn. But he believed that his God was all powerful. And so it didn't matter that he only had 10 people. He, he served an all powerful God. And he would say, too many people are behaving as if God can't, isn't powerful enough to use a small church. Uh, yeah. You can't use a church with a bad location in a bad building. But, but uh, my dad really believed God could. And so sure enough, he did. This podcast is brought to you by Blackbee Ministries International. To find out more, visit blackbee.org. Well, welcome to the Richard Blackaby Leadership Podcast. My name is Sam, and I'm your host, and the one helping take our leadership to new heights, to the next level. Uh, we've There's got, always more uh, room to go, to grow. That, that is true. That is true. And uh, Richard, it's good to have you uh, with us today. Um, today, again, it's, uh, uh, last week was a a special episode, um, and we got to hear from your father and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, um, cause I, I never really knew him in his heyday Yeah, and it's, it's always fascinating to go back and to listen to some of those, um, sermons and just the sort of, uh, the fire that he had, um, when he preached and, you know, what, what strikes me uh, is, you know, and I don't mean this as an insult, but how ordinary Henry was, mm-hmm. and yet how how extraordinary God uh, used him in such just powerful ways. Yeah. And if you meet him, it's, it's he's just Henry, you know, yeah. but, and yet God would just use him in just profound ways throughout his life. Um, yeah, I think I think you're right. Of course, as he got older and and frailer, he seemed even perhaps more ordinary. Uh, but uh, but even in his heyday, uh, he would have been. You would have, if you didn't know who he was, what he'd done, he would have just seemed like a very ordinary person. Yeah. Well, so today we want to remember Henry, and uh, you've got some some thoughts, some reflections yeah. on on his life. But before we do that, um, we do have an event coming up in May. Uh, May 15th through the 17th, that's going to be at the Billy Graham Training Center at the Cove, a place where your dad spoke yeah, quite often. Yeah, two dozen times at least, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and you're going to be there speaking on the ways of God. Yeah. Uh, why why should people come uh, to that event? Well, you know, I, I, with as many churches and Christians uh, that, uh, that are scattered all over North America, uh, and try and do so much church work, I think often we just wonder, well, why is God not blessing? I mean, we're trying to reach our community. We're preaching the the, the, the gospel, the truth, and yet uh, maybe our church is declining, or at least it's not reaching people, or we're having trouble paying our bills, and we'd think that God would be wanting to help us here uh, yeah. and make it easier. And there's, of course, lots of reasons for that, but... Uh, but I think one that I just more and more feel impressed um, as I look upon the situation is that I think a lot of times we're trying to do uh, the right thing, but we're doing it the wrong way. And uh, I think we have no idea how much the world has crept into our methodology, uh, our approaches. We, we're so mm-hmm. used to doing things the world way at, at work and in our own personal life that we go to the church and and we don't even realize that there's a different way than the one that we've always used. And, and so the ways of God is just saying, what is the way God does things? What, because of course the way you do something reflects your character and God's character is very different than the world's. And so of course he's going to do things differently. Uh, and so this is just a conference, uh, based on a book I wrote last year, the ways of God. Um, and, at the moment, at least, the the, uh, the residences, the the rooms at the Cove itself are are all full, but uh, there's lots of hotels nearby, the Hampton Inn, the Holiday Inn, uh, that you can stay in nearby and still attend. There's room in the auditorium for people to attend. I'd encourage you to get your name on the wait list for, for rooms on site because uh, there's always people that have to cancel at the last minute, but uh, in case they don't, or you're too far down the wait list, uh, I, I encourage you still to come. Uh, you might even you know, work out a pretty good deal if you've got hotel points or something. 
Uh, and uh, you can, you, if you want, you can still register to get your meals on site, which yeah. is great. Yeah. So you can spend lots of time at the Cove and hang out at the chapel and, and so on, the, the, the bookstore downstairs and some things like that. But, uh, uh, but I, I encourage you still to come. There is room in the auditorium still. Yeah. And uh, so at some point that'll get that can get capped off as well. But uh, I think last time I checked, there's still space there. So get a get a Holiday Inn is is probably the closest one. But uh, Ham, there's some Hamptons nearby and other things yeah. as well. So uh, you know, and and you may just want to just eat off site as well and uh, and save even maybe some more money. And then it's not that expensive just to attend the conference itself if you've covered your room and. Uh, and maybe your meals as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's we're looking forward to that. And uh, as always, we'll leave links to to all that uh, in the show notes of today's episode. Uh, with that out of the way, uh, Richard, um, your reflections on your father. Yeah. Well. Uh, he, yeah. Can you I, can you I, summarize this I, in, I, in one yeah. episode? I, I think. Yeah, we'll you know, see. Um, this could probably easily be a, a, a multi episode series, but. Yeah. Um, and I thought about even writing a biography. I've had lots of people say that we should write a biography about him, and we might do that at some point. Um, but uh, yeah, for a guy that I've known my entire life, um, uh, and someone that is considered a great, uh, great man of God by many, uh, it, to try to summarize in in a podcast is can be a challenge. But I thought I would just share just a few facts and and observations as his oldest son. I was talking to Gigi Graham one time, the oldest child of Billy Graham, and she told me, she said people asked uh, her, well, which of the six or so, I think it's six kids, and they're uh, Billy Graham's kids, uh, which was which one was his, Billy Graham's favorite? And she said, well, I, I can't say that he loved me the most, but she said, I can say he loved me the longest. And, uh, and <laughs> Yeah, so, I've, I've certainly heard you uh, claim that title <laughs> so, a time or two. <laughs> so uh, I can I got that from her, but uh, yeah. So he he loved me the longest of the five kids <laughs> in our family. But uh, but Dad was born on uh, April fifteenth on, on nineteen thirty five. Uh, he liked, of course, he always said that was tax day. Um, <laughs> yeah. And he said it's better than being born on April 1st, on April Fool's Day. So, but uh, he was born in uh, uh, a little town called uh, Williams Lake, British Columbia, Canada, uh, just kind of in interior British Columbia. And early on, uh, I'm not quite sure when, but he was still just a preschooler or, or less, just a very young child. Uh, his family moved to... Um, to Prince Rupert, which is way, way up in the northwest corner of Canada, uh, just about 90 miles south of the Alaska border, right on the right on the ocean. And Dad always described it as a place where sailors came and went. It was a uh, railroad uh, went through there. There were a lot of mines in the area, so miners lived there. There was a lot of uh, what we, in Canada you call First Nations, Native uh, American Indian uh, people uh, that lived nearby as well. And he said it just was a place with a lot of violence, a lot of crime, a lot of drunkenness, uh, ungodliness. And his father um, was a bank manager that was transferred there. And, and famously, his grandfather just said, um, I, we looked around, he was a Baptist, and he looked around and couldn't find a Baptist church to go to. And so he, he just started one. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so... Uh, my grandfather was a, a layman all of his life, uh, but he he was a an evangelist. He was a church planter, uh, and so my dad, in the the formative years of his childhood, grew up with his dad as uh, his pastor, and then just as the leading layman in the whole church. and uh, And then ultimately, when my dad and his two brothers were uh, about time about the age to start college. Uh, my grandfather put in for a transfer down to Vancouver, the big city in that province, so they'd be nearby a local university. And my grandfather, though he's a bank manager, was he, he, he never made a lot of money. Uh, he was kind of in rural, smaller branches, uh, and just uh, ne never accumulated a lot of wealth. And so he, um, but he, uh, w he wanted to try to help them all go to school and university. And so they. They could. I, I don't know if I think they. I assume that they maybe lived at home, but um, and and commuted to school each day. But uh, but he graduated from there, and then um, at that point, uh, just kind of interesting. His uh, his his father's life kind of um, 
began to be a little bit influenced by Southern Baptists, and they were just um, they were impressed by the fact that um, that they were that Southern Baptists seemed to be very uh, biblically oriented, a very local church uh, focused, and uh, and I, I don't know how much my grandfather encouraged him with this, but Dad decided that to go to seminary, he would uh, go down to San Francisco, the nearest uh, Southern Baptist seminary. And so he did that, and uh, and that's the first time he ever became a member of a Southern Baptist church, which he never left. He he was a Southern Baptist all of his life after that. Met my mother, uh, got got married to her, started having uh, they had their all four of their sons. They had while they still lived in in California, um, and Dad would pastor two different churches down there, and uh, both of them very difficult. Uh, the first one was in a really high crime riddled area. A lot of violence, uh, drug use, uh, gangs fighting in the area, uh, and he he pastored that church and uh, turned it around and began to have a, a huge impact on its community. And then he was called to a church in Los Angeles that uh, had divided, split three different ways, had three different factions, and they called him uh, and just a second church. He'd only been pastoring for about four years, and uh, and God blessed that church and healed it, uh, made it a very, very exciting church to, to be a part of at the time. And uh, and it looked like he was on a, a great trajectory to a, a great ministry. And then, of course, he felt called to go to, to Canada, to Saskatoon in 1970, and uh, a church of 10 people, discouraged. Um, and it's interesting how God just seemed to always use whatever he had done in my dad's life to kind of build on that. Uh, just mm-hmm. every experience was just the perfect building block for what God had next for him. But uh, he had done some great ministry in California, but I think he really took it to another level in Canada. And interestingly, he had probably the fewest resources there of people and money. Uh, but uh, at that point, he'd had enough experience to be able to trust God. And uh, and so I, I, I was thinking just as I looked back, of course, then he he was there for 12 years at Faith Baptist, uh, eventually was called to be a, a area missionary in uh, Vancouver, where he had gone to university. Um, and God blessed that that association. It just seemed like everywhere my dad went, he, he, uh, he didn't stand out as just the most charismatic, dynamic, organized, cutting edge, uh, technology kind of leader. Uh, but everywhere he went, he just had this confidence that God was going to do something and mm-hmm. God always did. And you just kind of knew, uh, he, he wasn't always seeking the limelight, wasn't always giving fiery impassioned speeches. He was always soft spoken. Um, but there was just something about his presence that told you, uh, God's in this and you want to be a part of it too. And so eventually he was called to, to come down to, to Atlanta to work for the whole mission board of the Southern Baptist convention and again, that was a position that had been empty for a while because who who do you get to represent uh, one of the biggest denominations in in the United States um, uh, to represent revival, to speak on behalf of what does God look for in revival? And uh, but they finally found this Canadian, and uh, he came to that role, and he was hired in uh, I think maybe near the end of 1988 or so, and. Uh, by 1990, Experiencing God came out, and then that, of course, just propelled him to a whole different stratosphere of ministry and travel. And I think a lot of people probably don't realize, but he was in his 50s, I think, when Experiencing God. Yeah, like 55 he didn't write, years He didn't old. write his first book until he was 55. Yeah, he's like 55 years old and had just had years of experience. And, uh, and, it's, and, you know, I was trying to think about when did my father begin just cognitively, physically to begin to decline. And, and it was a slow decline for my dad over a number of yeah. years of just memory beginning to fade a bit, energy, physical strength and stature. But, um, but, but I would say by, ni- by about the time he was 70, uh, certainly by 71, he started having some health issues. So, so his... You know, he did lots of great ministry for years in Canada and yeah. California, but what he's perhaps most famous for as far as being an author and an international speaker lasted about 15 years. Uh, he put about 3 million miles on Delta Airlines <laughs> in 15 years. And um, and so 
uh, yeah, that, and so you know, if I if I just kind of impressions of my dad just over the course of his life, like what was it about him? And of course, that's something I, I think all of his kids have pondered, and I certainly have given a lot of thought to it. I've got whole uh, boxes of his devotional notes, his quiet time notes, and just what he was thinking about, and journals, and I've read through a lot of them, and uh, heard him preach, and been around him all my life. Um, and I, I keep asking myself, so why is it that God used him so powerfully? Um, you know, and, and there were lots and lots of people in ministry around him, authors, speakers, pastors, and certainly God used other people as well, but um, few people did he use with such impact uh, yeah. to, to that degree. And you just have to say, so what was it that God saw in him that God felt was so pleasing to him that he would do that? Um, and so just a couple observations just about just dad as a person and how God used him. One is that he, um, he was an introvert. Can God use introverts and put them on a public stage? Uh, and, and, but he, he, he was an introvert who liked people. And my mother, of course, did, like was addicted to people. She was the off the chart extrovert, but, yeah. uh, dad, dad wanted to have his alone time. He wanted to, and, and so the dad would typically get up really early, maybe four o'clock in the morning. Typically he needed that time alone with God, just that time alone, uh, yeah. to just think and process. Uh, but then when he hit the stage, when he was, you know, got headed to the airport, he was, uh, uh, you know, he, he was ready to go. And, and I've, I've had many people tell me that, they might have been assigned to maybe after dad finished speaking at a conference, their their job was to drive him to the airport. And sometimes it'd be an hour or more away. And they've said sometimes dad wouldn't say a word. I mean, if if you asked him a question, he would. But he was just always in his thoughts and processing perhaps what had just happened. And uh, he, he, or he'd sleep. He just had no need to talk. And he he was perfectly content to be quiet. And certainly as he got older, you saw that even more and more. Um, and he, I, I think something else about my dad is he, he just truly believed what he was saying. He, yeah. he, this was not just kind of his shtick that he used in his career and, and trying to promote churches or whatever else. Um, he believed it and he, and he, and he believed that God was an awesome God. And he, I mean, you could drop my dad into a church with only 10 people with a for sale sign and out in, on the front of the lawn, but he believed that his God was all powerful. And so it didn't matter that he only had 10 people. He, he served an all powerful God. And he would say too many people are behaving as if God can't, isn't powerful enough to use a small church. Uh, yeah. You can't use a church with a bad location in a bad building. But, but, uh, my dad really believed God could. And so sure enough, he did. Um, mm. and, uh, and a lot of people I think like to be around my dad because they just felt like here's a man who doesn't just preach this stuff. He, he really believes it and yeah. he, and he acts like it's true. And people just want to be a part of that. Um, and something that my dad taught me as well, uh, throughout his whole ministry was to be God centered and not self centered. Many, many times I'd hear him in church say this, if someone was giving a report in a business meeting or just, just telling them about the problems they were facing. Uh, or when I would do that and I would come and say, you know, dad, here's this problem. He would say, now, now restate that, but make it God centered, not self centered. And yeah. I'd say, but it's my problem. <laughs> I'm telling you about what I'm facing. And he'd say, yeah, but God is in the room. God is on his throne. So mm. state your problem in light of the fact that God is still firmly uh, placed on his throne, ruling the universe with all the resources of heaven at his disposal. Now, now describe your situation with that as a backdrop. Mm. And that, that would just change everything. That's a powerful exercise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and he do that in business meetings. Someone would say, we're, you know, didn't take in enough money last month in the budget. Okay, well, that's true. And we need to know that. But uh, now state that in terms of God with a cattle on a thousand hills um, that is guiding our church and promise to provide for it. And and it was just always, he would say, you, we just keep leaving God out all the time. He would say, mm -hmm. no. You know, tell the truth. I mean, give tell us how much money's in the checking account. That's what the finance person's supposed to do. But, but just do it in the broader context that we serve an all powerful God. And, and you know, when you start, when he would just keep chirping at you like that, you begin to realize just how 
self-centered we were, that yeah. we really didn't do more than what we thought we could do, what we could afford, uh, what we had the strength for, the numbers for. And my dad never limited himself to that. My mm-hmm. dad always said, but we serve an almighty God. Let's, let's behave as if we really do. Uh, and of course, he was uh, he was an optimist. It just kind of goes along with that. How, how can you see? Dad always said, "How can you see Almighty God sitting upon His throne, ruling the universe, and not be an optimist?" And he, he said, "I read the end of the book. I know how the story turns out." He said, "How can you not be an optimist?" And and Dad, almost to a fault, was uh, always just optimistic about how things would would could happen. And so. Uh, he, I just never saw him discouraged. I never saw him lose hope. He all he just refused to. He just refused to. And 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 I don't think it was the power of positive thinking. I think it was it, it was trying to be true to his convictions. If God really is as powerful as we say He is, then we need to be acting uh, as if we, we expect victory. We expect God to to accomplish His purposes. And I, I think kind of related to being an optimist was he was he was an idealist as well. He and I, and I think sometimes for my dad that could also that could be both a positive and a negative, mm-hmm. um, because he saw things so positively. Christ is the head of our church, so what do we have to worry about? But then sometimes there might be problems in the church, and uh, he might not be as quick to always jump on them and address them as maybe he should have been. Uh, I mean, he would. It wasn't like he'd just always avoid them, but he just had such confidence in God working out his purposes that sometimes I think he could just kind of let some things go unaddressed. And and I've had to kind of learn from that because I tend to be on the other end of that uh, that spectrum where probably there's times I, I've jumped on things too too quick and just. But you know, my my nature is, hey, we got something to work out. Let's let's get it fixed. But. Uh, but I think sometimes my dad realized, well, God will work some of those things out if you just give him the opportunity. Uh, and so sometimes I think he should have probably gotten on it quicker. There's sometimes he probably should have addressed some things. But uh, and so I think, you know, like like with most things, our strengths can also be a weakness, mm-hmm. uh, just depending on how far we let him go. Uh, but he he saw always saw what could be. He said, every time God looks at you, he doesn't just see who you are. He sees who you could become. And he felt the same way about the church. He would say, well, the church isn't all that it ought to be yet, but that's where God's taken it. Uh, and so he yeah. he was always confident of that. And just a couple other things. He was a student of the Bible. Uh, people loved to hear him preach and teach uh, because in, invariably he always referenced the Bible somehow. And I remember talking to someone that was going to have my dad come to a major, major conference, and the guy wanted to make sure my dad understood that this was a unique audience of certain kind of people, and they they had a a, a pretty catchy kind of uh, theme for the conference, and uh, and they'd give my dad a topic, and so they they wanted to make sure he he understood what it was they were wanting from him, and so they told dad Here, here's here's all the information, and and my dad just didn't really say anything; he just kind of sat there. And this guy was telling me this later. He said, I, th- I thought maybe your dad hadn't heard us. I thought maybe he wasn't paying attention. He said, I was getting a little annoyed that here we are giving your dad all this important information, and he's not even writing it all down and asking any kind of pertinent questions. And so he said, Henry, do, do you understand what we're saying? Are you are you tracking with us what we're trying to help you understand? And, and my dad had said, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. He said, I was just trying to... In my mind, I was trying to just think what scriptures would best address the theme that you're talking about. And I'm thinking about this scripture or that scripture that would really speak to the heart of what you seem to be trying to get at. And this guy said, I just felt like a spiritual pygmy at that moment, he said, because your dad's first thought was always to what scripture would unpack that concept. He said, we just had a cute theme that rhymed. And <laughs> we're like... <laughs> And your dad had gone so much deeper immediately, and uh, and so that's that's something Dad always did. Uh, people would ask him and say, "Henry, do you know do you know a a good book on uh, conflict management?" And he would say, "Yeah, I do." Uh, oh well, what is it? He said, "Well, First Corinthians." And they they'd go, "Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I know the Bible." They said, "But like, I mean," and, and my dad my dad would often say, well, yeah, I know what you meant. And he said, and that's the problem. Uh, you always go to God's word first. It's it's not like dad didn't believe in books. He wrote a bunch of them, but 
but he would say, but think biblically, always be going back to say what verse, uh, what, what book in the Bible speaks to this very yeah. issue. And he said, sadly, a lot of pastors don't even think that way. A couple other things to say about dad. He was never technology driven, which is probably an understatement. He, dad didn't know how to send an email, didn't know how to send a text, <laughs> didn't know what social media was. Um, uh, we we tried at various times to get him computers. He just used his computer as a type. He could, he was a good typist. He could type, but um, but he he had no understanding interest in social media. Uh, and in our day, you sort of think, how could you have a public ministry and be a best selling author and not do that? But um, but I feel like uh, when I think about how much time I spend just answering emails, just how much time I spend on my laptop. Um, you 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 wonder sometimes wh- where could you go in scripture where could you go in meditation and prayer if you didn't have those distractions yeah and, and so I, I i i suspect he probably missed out on some things as well because he didn't ever use that but i mean he had staff and others that would use it but um but i think he he also just i think early on decided to be very focused on some things and uh and not to be distracted by other things uh, you know, I would also say about my dad, even though he's an introvert, I mentioned he 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 truly enjoyed people, and uh, and he enjoyed them just for who they were, and he and he and I, you know I think it's interesting just how much um, he never saw himself as a celebrity. Like when he'd be introducing me to some missionary that he that that uh, we cross paths with, or a pastor of some relatively small church somewhere in, in rural America, someplace. My dad would be all excited. Like he would really want me to meet this friend of his who serves in the among the Native American Indians in in uh, New Mexico, or that ha- this woman that's a prayer warrior, and just and you you think most of the time the the people my dad was introducing me to probably were not as famous as my dad was, but you wouldn't think so by the way Dad talked about them. Hmm. He was genuinely excited and just so impressed with their ministry to the inner city in some big American city or some missionary that plug in away in a very difficult mission field. And he'd say, Richard, you just, I, it's, I really want you to get to know my friend here that he serves and he's just one of God's finest was how my dad would describe a lot of these people. Hmm. And, and you, because he, he never saw himself on some pedestal looking down on others. He, he truly was just so delighted to, to meet people, especially that were serving his God. Um, and just a couple other things to say. He he was always processing. He was always thinking. Uh, processing was just such a big word for Dad. It was always here's what's happening in the world. Here's what's on the news. But here's what God says in His Word, and I'm just trying to put those together. Here's what's happening. But here's what God has said. And how, how do I how do I understand this in light of what God has said in His Word? And he also was uh, very very, very uh, legacy was very important to him. He, he he shared a poem that his father had given him, and he shared it with all of his kids, and it was basically about his name. And his father gave him this poem that basically talked about the fact that he's, his father uh, said, I, I spent my entire life putting value into the name Blackaby. Uh, no one had heard of Blackaby uh, before my grandfather uh, would meet them, and he would say, but I want to add such value to that name that when people hear the name Blackaby, they think of integrity, they think of godliness, and so on. And and so he said, so son, I can't give you a lot of money, uh, but I can give you my name. And, and I've spent my whole life investing in that name. And mm-hmm. so now it's I'm handing it to you. So be careful how you handle that investment. And certainly wow. my dad handed uh, to his kids a great name as well. And now we carry that name and we're passing it on. And uh, and so he, he always was thrilled that his four kids were all, or five kids were all in ministry uh, and that his grandkids uh, were in ministry. And, and that really was one of the great delights of his life was that he could die knowing that he had a son that was running his ministry, a son that was pastoring the church he went to, the kids that were serving in all manner of different ways. And, and so he, he, it wasn't up to him to carry on the message. He had raised up uh, the next generation that will carry on that ministry, that focused, and and hopefully even take it to places my dad was never able to. And uh, maybe just the last, just a couple, last one just to, to mention. My, my parents were always very generous. 
they always gave far more than they could afford to give. Uh, they literally would give you the last penny they had in their in their pockets uh, if you had a need. They fed more people passing through their humble little house. Had When he was a pastor, he's probably had one of the smallest houses of anyone in the church, but I'm sure fed more people, had more people pass through there, just always keeping guests and uh, having dinner guests. Uh, uh, my my parents were constantly giving money to various causes and missionaries in their church and uh, to their kids' ministries. Uh, just if they had it, they just gave it. And I could I could just identify all kinds of ways where, uh, you know, even as as my mom was getting older and uh, before she knew she was dying, uh, she was already just giving away stuff. She just like, hey, do you like this? What well, here, take it. <laughs> just uh, I'd rather. I'd rather you take it and enjoyed it now than uh, uh, than uh, you know me die and wonder whatever happened to it. It's, and and so I you know they just uh, they were just such generous spirits. Um, and uh, I think anyone that knew them knew that if if there was any way they could help, not just with their money, but if they could champion a cause, if they could try to call up friends and whatever they could do to try to help you when they knew you had a need, they yeah. they'd love to do that. Um, and uh, and and just I mentioned the reputation. My dad just never worried about so much what people thought of him. He what he worried about was what God thought of him. And uh, he just he a, a key verse for him was First uh, Samuel two thirty, where God said to Samuel, uh, "If you will honor me, I will honor you." And so my dad said, "All I need to do is worry about honoring God, and then I leave my reputation in His hands. God can do with that whatever He wants." And so I, maybe lastly, I touched on this already, but just uh, just a humility. My dad is mm. Canadian. Canadians tend not to put people on pedestals as much, perhaps, as Americans do. But but uh, his feet just always stayed on the ground. And they knew that, you know, when, you, when you've been invited to the White House or you've been invited to speak for, for weeks all over the world, uh, you know that God's using you in a special way, but... Uh, but but at the end of the day, no matter what they what they did, I I, I I was with my parents many many times after they had done a real significant kind of thing, and they'd almost be like school kids, just like just can you believe that that God let us do that? That we just they always knew they were ordinary people, and they they knew that uh, it was only because God had put His hand on them and was showing them His favor that they were invited to do many of the things that they were invited to do. And they also knew that when God's timing was done, when God's work was finished for them, uh, that he, he, he'd he be done with them. And they, they, they were servants. Uh, it wasn't about them. Uh, my dad was just a servant of God. And, uh, and I think that's why God just kept using him, because uh, my dad was never in danger of touching the glory of God. And because of that, God was able to entrust him with, with much. Mm. Well, thank you, Richard. Uh, and it's just, it's always amazing for me to, to hear you go on about your dad. And uh, it's just, what an incredible life and an incredible example to so many. Yeah. So thanks for taking us through this. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, it really makes a difference if you leave a review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. We always love hearing from our listeners, so email us at podcast at blackme.org.